Welcome to Education Forum. I'm Herman Badillo, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the City University. The improvement of education affects all New Yorkers. This program will focus on the key educational issues and challenges before us all. My guest today is Professor John Monenkoff, who is a professor of political science at the Graduate Center of the City University and who is directs the Center for Urban Research uh, here at CUNY. He is a graduate of Carleton College in Minnesota, uh, specializing in political science, and he got his master's and PhD from Harvard University in political science. Uh, Professor Malenkov, you come here at the right time because the big discussion in the newspapers and the media today has to do with the census. And you have studied the census uh, over the years and uh, have commented on the current census. What do you make of the census in the city of New York today? Well, I think the 2000 census is probably the best one that we've had in li re uh, living memory in terms of accurately capturing uh, what's going on in the city. Uh, you don't think the undercount is, is high? Because I remember previous years, yeah, all of us Yeah, there's undoubtedly an undercount. Yeah. And yeah. it's a very difficult and complex mm -hmm. undertaking. And there were certain neighborhoods where people were reluctant to return their forms and so on. So I'm not saying that it was perfect or there weren't problems, but I think that it, especially because of the efforts of the city planning department to make sure that the address list from which the census was conducted reflected all the new units that have been created in the last decade, uh, at least the census uh, enumerators went to the right places to look for people, which they didn't always do in the 1990 census. Okay, so if I ask you now, looking at the census for the year 2000, mm -hmm. comparing it with uh, 1990, what kind of city do we have today? Well, we have a city that's a lot less white in terms of non-Hispanic whites and a lot more of lots of different kinds of groups that are, you know, dubbed minority groups, but uh, taken together in New York City constitute a majority, Latinos, Asians, African Americans. And those minority groups are getting increasingly diverse. Each of those broad categories is made up of many different well, let's take the uh, general breakdown. You mm -hmm. have 29% white, right. uh, 27% Hispanic or thereabouts, 10% right. uh, Asian, mm -hmm. and 34, 35% so-called whites. Now, um, the big increase has been in the Hispanic population, right? right? The black population, for some reason, has not really changed that much. Well, I or think... has it? Well... It's grown slightly in terms of the net numbers, but I, I think you see a number of different trends going on within the black population of New York City. There's been a lot of black suburbanization over the last decade. Uh, there's also been a, a, a sort of return to the south of, of okay, native but, stock Okay, but if, if you have blacks from the city that have gone to the suburbs mm -hmm. or to the south, and the black population is about the same, well, you've then had a that lot means of you had a lot of immigration. Right, from the West Indies. And it would be from the West Indies. So that's a mm -hmm. different, isn't yeah. that a different uh, Absolutely. culture? Absolutely. And yes, very well, yes, it is uh, mm -hmm. a different culture. So I think that's a good case in point of the, of the general proposition that as the city's getting more, I mean, less white, it's not getting more of any one specific uh, sort of homogeneous racial group. It's becoming more and more complicated because not only are there differences between native uh, stock African Americans and West Indian immigrants, but there are differences between Haitians and people from the English-speaking West Indies and people from Guyana and Trinidad. Many are Afro-Caribbean, but many are, are also of uh, Indian origin. So. Uh, you have a very complex picture emerging here where you, one simple label doesn't really, you know, fit populations as well as it, it might have at one point. Of course, here we're concerned primarily about education. Mm -hmm. uh, do you find that the Caribbean uh, blacks have a different attitude towards education than the uh, native uh, or uh, southern blacks who have come to the city? Well, I think everybody understands that it's really important to get an education to get ahead in this economy and that it's, uh, if you drop out of high school, you're consigning yourself to the dead-end jobs or if, if you're even able to get a job. And so th there's probably the aspiration that's pretty uniform across groups to, to get more education. Um, but the ability to accomplish that seems to vary across groups. 
And, and the West Indian immigrants in New York City and their children uh, seem to be doing a little bit better than Native African Americans in terms of the level of uh, education that they're attaining. And, uh, you know, the proportion of the school-age population or college-age population that's uh, actually engaged in, in study. And that's related to their background uh, in the uh, Caribbean? Well, I'm not sure. This is an interesting thing to try and untangle that we're working on uh, right now in our study of the immigrant second generation. Um, because I think when West Indian immigrants come to New York, um, the way the largest society reacts to them, uh, especially when they experience discrimination, and it, it, it does happen, uh, sort of heightens a racial identity uh, for them that they may not have had back on the island because basically everybody is black. The elite in Jamaica say, if you look at the skin tone of the prime minister, it's very light compared to the, to the average person. And, you know, there are racial distinctions in Jamaica, but they're, they're nothing like the racial distinctions Listen, here. Listen, that, that applies to us in the uh, Puerto Rican community. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, those of us who were born in Puerto Rico uh, don't understand this business of uh, minority groups because uh, in Puerto Rico we're all Puerto Ricans. Right. And, and we don't distinguish between right. white Puerto Ricans so or black a, Puerto can, Ricans or other Puerto Ricans. It can be a kind I, of rude shock to yeah, come to New York. I found it very strange when I came here about 12 that you know they have mm -hmm. these rigid uh, color lines here in the United States. Well, but now talking about the Hispanic community where there has been uh, perhaps the largest increase, uh, it's not primarily from Puerto Rico, is it? In no, in years. fact, the Puerto Rican well, share of the Latino population has been steadily falling, and it's it's well less than half now. Whereas in 1950 and 1960, Puerto Rican and Latino would so or where is the new migration almost, coming from? Well, the Dominican Republic is certainly the single largest sending country, but also Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a huge growth in the Mexican population mm -hmm. between 1990 and 2000. I used to live in San Francisco, and I was very fond of uh, shopping for Mexican ingredients. And when I moved to New York in 1980, there, were, there was no Mexican pres presence, and I couldn't, you know, it was hard to buy a tortilla if you wanted one. <laughs> Today, uh, you know, the Mexican presence is very pervasive, mm -hmm. and if you go to East Harlem, right. it's and primarily I, yes. uh, people of, of Mexican ancestry who are living there, and not, it's not the sort of Puerto Rican uh, center of gravity that it was at, at one point. Well, those uh, groups from the Dominican Republic and from Mexico and uh, Latin America, uh, that migration is going to continue, as far as Absolutely. I know, from having visited those countries, mm -hmm. and is going to grow at, even f at an even faster uh, pace in the next 10 years. Yes, I think, well, you know, the Asian population has grown very rapidly, but it's f starting from a small base. And so in an additional number of people can produce a high percentage rate of growth. The Latino population was already huge, but even there, very large rates of, of inflow uh, from, from the countries that you've mentioned. The U.S. has very close commercial ties. There's strong family ties. Mm -hmm. It's easy to come back and forth. Countries like the Dominican Republic and Mexico are promoting dual citizenship. Uh, so there are all kinds of institutional and family bridges that are being built between these sending countries in New York City that's going to keep the flow coming unless, you know, something happens to completely close which, the which gates. I, which I doubt that would happen. As a matter of I fact, agree. it's the other way around because the, the, the changes to the immigration bill are bringing out uh, a lot of people who were uh, undocumented mm -hmm. immigrants who are getting married before a deadline or um, getting a job visa so they can stay here. And that means that sooner or later, right. they will be reaching out to other relatives. When Absolutely. They come from, right? Absolutely. Uh, now, let's talk about the Asians, because 10 percent, which is what it is mm -hmm. now, it's a serious percentage. It's, it's no longer just a minor right. group. Um, but what, what are the uh, major groups that make well, up the 10 percent? Chinese, particularly from the People's Republic of China, but also from Taiwan, Hong Kong, and elsewhere in the Chinese diaspora are, are the biggest uh, Asian group and account for about half. Uh, the Chinese um, have been, ever since the immigration reforms in the mid-1960s, have been flowing into New York very, very steadily. But 
their whole host of Asian the groups that the U.S. Census classifies Let's as Asian. Let's say Chinese is one, if number one. What's the second group, would you say? Well, uh, nationally, it would probably... I mean, talk about in the city. Okay. Um, Koreans are very mm -hmm. large, for sure. In the Indian population is large and growing. Uh, there are other South, A South, South Asians like Bang Bangladeshis and Pakistanis. Uh, but then there are, are Filipinos. That's a pretty substantial group. Uh, so you have a whole range of countries that each send... Um, well, I find that the, uh, the Asians uh, do very well at the city university. We have a growing Asian uh, population here. Absolutely. And uh, they, they come here basically not knowing the language, right? Well, it depends. A lot of them, people coming from Hong Kong or Taiwan, for example, or for Indi from India, probably if, if they were a small child going to school in those countries, they would have learned English. English is a, a language of instruction in many of these countries. And they're also, many of them have fairly well-educated parents. Um, so that, um, and in fact, among Indians, for example, the level of educational oh, yes, attainment course, yeah, is higher yeah. than among non-Hispanic whites in the city. Well, in, in, in among generally the, uh, the Asian community, it seems to me that uh, the level of educational mm -hmm. attainment is higher. Um, what and, would you attribute And our this studies to? show that uh, Chinese and other Asian groups choose where to live in New York City partly on the basis of how good the schools are. And they make real sacrifices to move to a place where uh, the schools are, are thought to be Good, and they're they're very focused on using the New York City public school system as a path of upward mobility. My my daughter is just graduating from Stuyvesant High School this year, and uh, in Stuyvesant right now, about fifty five percent of the kids are Asian. Well, that's um, that's incredible, given that it is. It's a uh, it's only ten percent of the population. That's so right. How do you explain that? Well, um, other than the fact that. Stuyvesant is a really great place to go to high no, school. No, no, but how do you explain <laughs> the fact that so many well, of the Asian kids perform as high I, I, as they do? I'd say it's a combination of the families coming in with fairly high levels of education and a focus on professional careers as the thing, uh, as the aspiration for what, what kids should, should do with their lives, and a very strong focus on how to make the system, take best advantage of the system. Uh, studying for the tests that are, you know, the science high school test that uh, is the gateway to application for Bronx uh, Science and Brooklyn Tech and Stuyvesant. Um, making sure that e even at the cost of long commutes or a sacrifice in uh, what the family has to pay for housing to, you know, to get access to the good schools. Whereas uh, we, our respondents uh, in our study on the immigrant second generation from Latino neighborhoods uh, often say that even if they had access to better schools, their parents really wanted them to stay close to home. They were scared of having them travel on the subway, especially for girls, felt the neighborhood was dangerous or traveling long distances was dangerous. And therefore, even when the local school might not be as good as a program mm -hmm. somewhere yeah. else, there was a, a real emphasis on keeping people close by, keeping, keeping a close watch on children. Okay. We'll be back after these announcements. You don't have to like me. Or you can. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to run with me. You really don't have to run away from me. And we're not all that different. I like good food. Good music. I want a good job. I want my kids to live in a world where they are safe and loved and respected for who they are. You don't have to like me, but if you talk to me... You might. We can end prejudice if we talk to each other. Call. Call. Tell us what you'd do. Together we can build one America. Next trip to the store, look for products made from recycled materials. Then buy them. Call 1-800-2-RECYCLE for your free Buy Recycle shopping guide. We're back today with Professor John Molenkoff, who is professor of uh, sociology and a professor of uh, political science at the Graduate Center here at the City University, and he is director of the Center for Urban Research. Now, we talked about the figures, but let's interpret them. What does that mean uh, in English for the future of New York? You said in the newspapers recently that when you looked at the breakdown and the areas where the different groups live, 
that some level of dissimilarity is expected. Does that mean that New York City in the year 2000 is more segregated than it was in 1990? Well, if you, if you mean do whites and blacks live apart from each yeah. other, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. It was a high level of segregation in 1990, and it's still a high level of segregation today. And in fact, it's gotten a teeny bit higher over the decade rather than declining. Is that good for the future of the city? I don't think so, actually. Um, you know, the black-white racial distinction is the basic divide in our society, uh, and I think it's incumbent on all of us to work on ways to break that down. And it's insofar as it's realized in housing segregation, that's, that's probably a bad thing for white kids to grow up and not having any contact with black kids and vice versa, black kids to grow up in neighborhoods where whites are you know, just some, some sort of visiting authority or something like that. Um, well, you've written seven books on uh, the urban problems in the United States and in the city, and uh, including books about politics. You mm -hmm. wrote about the politics of the uh, Ed Koch uh, mayoralty. Right. Given the very complex structure of different groups that we have in the city now, what do you think that uh, for votes for the politics of the city of New York in the next, in this year's campaign and in the future? Well, New Yorkers are going to have to find a way to uh, build multiracial and multiethnic governing coalitions. I don't think that it's really viable for the city to say that one ethnic group is going to have enough votes to elect a mayor who will govern uh, mm -hmm. just on that basis. So, uh, and I think Mayor Giuliani, even though he was primarily elected with white, white, white votes, has often said in the wake of his elections that I'm going to spend time reaching out to other communities and I want to be the mayor of, of everyone. It's easier said than done sometimes. Okay, but, but the point is, given what you know about these different groups, are those coalitions possible or is there so much uh, division in point of view and uh, cultural background that the likelihood of a solid broad-based coalition uh, is uh, nearly impossible to fathom? Well, there's a couple of dimensions along which you could think of a coalition happening. One is that um, blacks and, Puerto and Latinos, uh, Hispanics in New York City and Asians generally are less well off than whites. They're, if you go to the headquarters of Citigroup, you're not going to find a lot, huge number of, of black and Hispanic and Asian um, senior officers of, of uh, the bank. Um, you'll find some, but primarily it's going to be a white suburban crowd. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that there is a, a, a feeling that uh, New York has had a fantastic economic success over the last decade, and it's important to make sure that that's paying off in opportunity for everyone, that everyone gets a fair shot, that uh, um, we have black investment bankers and Puerto Rican investment bankers alongside Episcopalian <laughs> and well, investment but bankers. But what do you say to the people who say that with the reduction in the number of uh, whites which will continue, and even now, those whites that are here include a large percentage of the elderly? Right. The, the, the blacks, uh, Hispanics, and Asians are predominantly young people, right? I and they're the ones you know, who will be having children. Every single institution yeah. based in New York faces the challenge of uh, generational and ethnic succession and promoting new talent and uh, changing the culture of the organization so that the group that's in demographic de uh, decline doesn't just kind of want to hold on for dear life. So what do you um, say to those groups who feel that uh, who are worried that the new groups that now make up uh, nearly two-thirds of the city, that they will not be able to perform as well as previous immigrant groups were able to perform? Well, I don't see any evidence of that. Um, I mean, just go to Stuyvesant High School again and, and, and look at the Asian kids, or go to Bronx Tech, I mean, uh, sorry, Brooklyn Tech, which uh, has a fairly substantial number of black students who are doing extremely well, um, and, and West Indian students, along with Asian students from the Lower East Side. So, I mean, you can find plenty of evidence of, of real, you know, uh, devotion and hard work and success and striving and all of the sort of basic American values that we all uh, think are central to the success of the country in 
in the immigrant and minority communities of New York City. Um, well, of so, course, we have. So I'd uh, say give people a chance and see what they see what they do. And yeah, and we can point to examples like Colin Powell, who uh, who grew up in the South mm -hmm. Bronx, right, and uh, is now a Secretary of State. So, and we can point to any number of people who are very prominent in life, not just in the city, but throughout the country, mm -hmm. who are from the more uh, recent immigrant groups. Um, but what about the problem that we're having in education, which is according to Judge Legrasse's opinion recently, that so few of our students even get a high school, a real high school diploma. Mm -hmm. He has pointed out that only 12% of the students in New York City get a, a Regents diploma, right. which is the real diploma. That means that we have to uh, and the do dropout something for rate 88%. Is, is stubbornly high, yeah. and you know, a third or so of the people who begin high school don't don't yeah, finish it, right. and many of those who are deemed to have finished are, have gotten GEDs, which really don't, um, you know, match up to, I think, a regular high school degree in terms of how how much they'll do for you in the labor market. So I absolutely agree with you that making sure that people make progress through the the um, grade school and high school system and make a transition into higher education and and get through higher education that. That really has to be our central mission, I think. So you would say York politically. If we don't do that right. Politically, the first priority would have to be education, right? Yes, but again, that's you know, it's easy to say and it's hard to do. And uh, there are so many different flavors of educational reform around the country, and so many opposed interests about how it should be done. That uh, it, it, it's a political, you know, quagmire and. It's not easy to point to some place around the country and say, well, Baltimore or Philadelphia or San Francisco has taken this set of problems and really, or even Milwaukee with school choice, you know, has really uh, solved these problems. Um, I have, I'm not an education policy expert. I have a lot of colleagues who are, who probably would be better guests on your show um, about this. But I actually think that I would like to see some of the lessons that were learned in the police department, uh, which were so successful in reducing crime, transferred to other policy areas in New York City, with education oh, being oh yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I would have the ComStat uh, system established within the educational system, including within CUNY, because the um, I just heard Police Commissioner Carrick speak before the uh, Association for a Better New York, and he made the point that every day uh, they review what has been happening, and because of the, uh, we live in an era of the computer, you can get instant information. Uh, but uh, every uh, commander, police commander, is held to a, an incredible level of accountability that couldn't be done uh, 10 years ago. Right. And this is the kind of thing that the system that has to be established for every one of the 1,065 schools that we have at the city of New York, and also for every one of the colleges, I believe. Well, there are a lot of issues about performance indicators, and there are a lot of things that aren't really in the control of the, um, the school principals. And, you know, probably one of the things that accompanied um, the real change of practice in the police department was to put more authority in the hands of the precinct commander and say, you're responsible for the results. Uh, where we where we assign accountability, we also have to give uh, the power to, to know, the make, make to the important principal, resource allocation. Well, that's the person who's managing the school. So, what what um, from your research, what power would you give to them that they don't have now? Well, you know, again, I'm not an expert in school policy, and most of my knowledge about the situation comes from being the parent of a New York City. A school mm -hmm. child and my own frustrations in uh, dealing with the rigidity of the Board of Education and, and, uh, and, and the school system on various fronts. Um, <clears throat> I guess, you know, I would like to see more parent involvement, more autonomy at the school level, more responsibility for principals, uh, more, you know, competition I among the different schools to att attract students. And more action where the uh the school has been failing year after year after year because we have around 100 such schools, right? Yeah, and those schools are in 
very low income neighborhoods, serving students who have very difficult uh, family situations. There's a lot of mobility in and out of the neighborhoods from, from one school to the next. Um, they're not viewed by the teachers as being desirable places to serve, and therefore those with, with uh, uh, some seniority gravitate away from those schools. Um, so we really have to, um, I think, rethink in a basic way how, how the schools that are serving the lowest income, most at-risk populations in the city function. And it may take, you know, substantially more resources than we're putting into them now, but it probably also takes some, some structural changes as well. Well, you have enough uh, information from the census to uh, keep you busy for the next <laughs> 30 years, so uh, we're all looking forward to see what the results of your research uh, may provide uh, to help us move along to bring about these changes. Uh, I want to thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. You can reach us by email at our website, www.cuny.tv, or write to us at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016.